Welcome everyone to Global Forum 2020, the COVID crisis lessons learned what next. I'm James Dedere and I'm the director of the Center for National Security Studies here at the University of Sydney. Before we begin, I'd like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. And I wish not only to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging, but also to acknowledge that um, the indigenous people were in many ways the first victims of the virus that came from the first encounter with the Europeans, the smallpox virus that nearly wiped out the uh, Gadigal population here. So this is a timely reminder. And as the director of the Center for National Security Studies, I'm very delighted today to have our first program um, that showcases our new initiative on eco-security. We try to bring together uh, experts and practitioners, advocates and activists, and deal with issues in a timely manner and uh, with a critical perspective you don't normally get, uh, certainly in the news and on many webinars. So we're uh, very fortunate today, I think, to um, have uh, Susan Park here, who's our new program leader for this research initiative on eco-security. And Susan's researched and written extensively on environmental, global environmental issues, also on uh, environmental advocacy and international organizations. Uh, she's well versed on the topic. So we're going to be looking today at the eco security threats and the relationship to COVID. And in many ways, I just I had a reminder today, I opened up an email and we have some participants here that Susan's going to introduce uh, from Canada. It's funny, we have Canada as well represented today, Susan. And uh, I had an email from a colleague who just took up a new job at the University of British Columbia. And he was saying, you know, I, I left the United States and it's followed me here. We have the worst air quality right now in Vancouver in the world. And from Sydney, we know what that's like, having experienced bushfires last summer. We know that the, the, both the virus and the climate change uh, and the wildfires share this common trait. They don't respect borders. And that's why it's a global security issue and why we're doing this from the, uh, under the auspices of the Center for National Security Studies. And I'm sure others will touch on this as well, but it's the case too that they share both COVID and climate change. The denial by the leader of the most powerful nation state uh, that in the early days that either really was a true issue indeed represented a global crisis. So it's um, my pleasure now to uh, hand it over to Susan. I just want you all to know, participants who are joining us, that you will have an opportunity to ask questions. And we look forward to those questions. Please, though, however, submit them via the Q&A um, rather than the chat option down at the bottom of your Zoom screens. OK, so with that, uh, we'll cut. And uh, the next person appearing will be Susan Park, our uh, research program leader of the Eco Security initiative. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, James. So as you mentioned, I'm a professor of global governance here at the University of Sydney and the research lead for uh, eco security. It is my absolute pleasure to run this first webinar for CIS and to identify the importance of eco security as it examines the interrelationship between biosphere integrity and international security. So this is really a webinar that seeks to identify just exactly how we can cut across human, national and global levels of analysis to address the most pressing issues at the interface of, of ecology and security. And the COVID-19 pandemic is one such event. Not only is it likely that the virus crossed from more than one species to another, it is spread rapidly throughout the world, leading not only to a global pandemic, that has killed over 860,000 people um, with cases in over 216 states, but a closing of borders that were not foreseen not even nine months ago. So the pandemic has revealed the fragility of our globalised world with health nationalism and increasingly fractious relationships between powerful states like the US and China. It has revealed failures even within advanced industrialised states to enact their emergency preparedness plans. Critics of multilateralism question whether or not we have the capacity to address contemporary, contemporaneous environmental health and economic crises. 
and indeed states have largely forgotten the immediate multilateral response that was evident in relation to the global financial crisis in 2008. Can we utilise international organisations like the World Health Organisation, like the UN Security Council and others to facilitate international cooperation to address COVID-19 in a way that does not perpetuate further environmental crises that could make states individuals and communities, and indeed species, more insecure. So here we examine the security lens, the intersection between the global pandemic and other crises, including climate change and biodiversity loss. The focus is a snapshot of current thinking of how we can make states and communities and individuals more secure. What role, if any, can these security apparatus play in order to address the challenges these face? So we want to make this as interactive as possible. I've got some questions for our panelists that I'm just about to introduce, and then we'll take um, some general questions and some questions from the audience. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, some experts from, uh, from overseas and from Australia uh, to talk to this pressing issue. I'd like to introduce Professor Simon Dalby from um, Wilfrid Laurier University and his research uh, welcome, Simon. His research focuses on climate change, environmental security and geopolitics. And his book, recently released this year with the University of Ottawa Press, is called Anthropocene Geopolitics, Globalisation, Security, Sustainability. Our next participant is Professor Emerita Lorraine Elliott from the Australian National University. Her research is on global governance and human security, transnational environmental crime, regional environmental governance in Southeast Asia, environmental security, climate security and human security, particularly focusing on the Asia Pacific. Our next participant is Associate Professor Matt McDonald from the University of Queensland. He focuses on critical theoretical approaches to security and their application such as environmental change, Australian foreign and security policy, climate politics and Asia Pacific security dynamics. And Dr. Robert McNeil is a senior lecturer here in the Department of Government and International Relations and a member of the CIS Ecosecurity Research Theme. Robert focuses broadly on the relationship between neoliberalism and climate policy with a particular focus on Anglosphere countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States and the United States. Uh, United Kingdom. So first I'd like to go to Simon Dalby. Um, my question to you is that your latest book looks at the rise of geopolitics and failures to address global environmental transformation. Can you elaborate on how the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating or interrupting those trends and what does this mean for international security? Over to you Simon. Thanks for that question. Um, a lot has changed in the last six months. Um, clearly the geopolitics that I'm worrying about in my book is about environmental transformation, but it has a lot of parallels with the COVID thing. First off, it's quite simply a matter of the pandemic has revealed in a similar way to climate change, just how interconnected a world we actually live in. Um, and I say live in rather than live on because we are part and parcel of the shifting, changing, dynamic planetary system. Um, we're not separate from it. Um, we are very much an uh, increasingly large component of it. And that is what the, the, the pandemic has simply reminded us all of that. Uh, prior to the pandemic, there was, of course, um, the rise of, of xenophobic nationalism in various parts of the world. And ironically, of course, the closing the borders um, strategy to try to prevent the spread of the disease fits in with some of the worst impulses of xenophobic nationalism. But simultaneously, we suddenly discovered that um, all the uh, personal protective equipment that we needed, um, masks um, and so on, um, were tied into global supply chains. Um, there were all sorts of production systems that required supplies from all over the world. So while we, in one sense, emphasized the local and the, the barriers and the competition, on the other hand, we suddenly realized we're all part of this huge global trading system. And so it's the interconnectedness of our world um, that I think the COVID pandemic has, has emphasized. And that's entirely consistent with the, uh, with the climate um, uh, situation. Uh, and I think that we are then highlighting um, the contradictions at the heart of how we try to administer global problems with, um, with state governments 
we try to think about sovereignty as the solution to problems which are actually um, uh, transcend borders all over the place. And so the, the pandemic has simply heightened our awareness of all of these things um, and the complex contradictions between them have become much, much clearer over the last six months. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I think we'll be able to touch on some of these contradictions as we go. I'd like to turn to Lorraine Elliott now. The pandemic has highlighted how viruses can jump species. Your research has looked at illegal trafficking in the trade of endangered species, particularly in Southeast Asia, and the rise of transnational environmental crime. What impact do you think the global pandemic will have on the wildlife species trade? Thanks, Susan, and thanks to you and James for the invitation to be part of this discussion. Um, the immediate impulse, I think, for these kinds of questions is that the securitized and what we might call even the weaponized uh, discourse around uh, around COVID-19 has traced source supposedly back to wet markets in Wuhan. We, we can talk about the specifics of that later, but that's sort of the immediate impulse. I think the broader context is uh, the increasing human exploitation of and pressure on ecosystems. It goes to the science point about the fact we live in, not with uh, nature. Um, pressure on habitat species, complexity of those uh, of those interactions, but in fact, this is this is a long there's a long trajectory of zoonotic diseases. That is diseases that jump from um, animals to humans, and in fact, there's a there's sort of a, a, an archaeological history of uh, the first domestication of animals and zoonotic diseases. So in the, in the in the Neolithic period. So we're not talking about something that's just happened. In fact, 60% of um, human infectious diseases are thought to have an animal origin. But the transmission pathways are still not, not as well known as we might expect. So that's the broader context, I think, for talking about the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, uh, it's an eco-security challenge in its own right, the illegal trade in, uh, in wild for, flora and fauna. Um, it's a global phenomenon. We tend to focus on Asia. Again, this is sort of the securitizing, weaponizing of this discourse. The United States is the second largest market in the world, uh, destination market in the world for illegally traded wildlife. The European Union is the third. So I think we have to we have to think about a, a different kind of geography about about this uh, as well. Also, we need to put this into context. So the recent UN report. On, um, on uh, preventing the next pandemic and breaking the chain of transmission that was released in July this year, uh, talks about um, the exploitation of wildlife is only one of a number of human mediated uh, transmission pathways. So climate change is another, agriculture is another, etc. And of those, of the exploitation of wildlife, illegal wildlife trade is only one of those. So for a lot of people, actually, the extensive wildlife trade and consumption of wildlife, nevertheless, is in a low probability but high risk category. So I think this is the real uh, thing there about putting this um, in, into context. So we can talk, if we want to, in the questions um, about some of those pathways through those that were not at transmission uh, and some of the, the issues that we know about and where those biosecurity issues and securities uh, lie. So the impact of the pandemic uh, on the ground, there's a number of different ways that conversation can go. It's not surprising. Politi the practice on the ground, there seems to be some evidence that local poaching has increased. So not necessarily going into the illegal trade, but there's some evidence from um, studies in India, um, in South America, um, in other parts of the world, that poaching has increased often for self-consumption. So this is because of the economic insecurities that people are actually looking for ways to supplement their protein uh, input, for example. Uh, it may also be just simply uh, um, a, a, an income generating that, that you know, small numbers of animals being caught can actually help to, uh, to generate income. That in the face of lockdown and, and job losses, uh, some of which are related to funding, what we're also finding is that is that ecotourism is, is closing down. So there's a flow on effect to other kinds of human insecurities around job losses, including those whose job is actually to protect species and to look after protected areas. Um, there's also increasing forms of vulnerability for rangers because if poaching is increases, that, that actually increases dangers for them if they're dealing with even local poachers. It's probably too soon to tell whether 
there's actually what the impact of the pandemic itself and these complex relationships is in terms of the actual transnational and international trade. Because of course, the way in which species are normally moved is through ship, by, by, by sea, probably less by plane, um, but also by just trans, by vehicles across borders. So if borders are being closed, then it's likely that there's a decrease in trade. However, we, there could be an increase in stockpiling in anticipation, uh, particularly around charismatic megafauna, in anticipation of borders opening up again. Um, that kind of stockpiling comes with its own risks for those involved. So again, we can, we can talk about this. You get conflicting reports. Some reports say there's been an increase in rhino poaching in South Africa. Other reports say there's been a, a decrease. So I don't think we actually know that kind of information. Um, um, and uh, I'll stop there, but I think we can also talk perhaps in the Q&A about some of the policy responses that have been put forward about ways in which we might respond to these very complex um, security, biosecurity and eco-security interactions between uh, pressure on wildlife, the illegal wildlife trade itself and, uh, and broader outcomes, not just around the pandemic, but about other forms of eco-securities as well. Thanks very much, Lorraine. I think it's incredibly important that you identify that we don't know the trends that are going on in terms of um, trade and endangered species, but it does also reveal the complexities. We get a lot of comments on and pictures on social media about how nature is coming back and species are, are taking over uh, now that people are staying home, but in actual fact, that it's a lot, it's a lot more complicated. You identified that there were other um, transmission processes in relation to low probability, high impact events like the pandemic, and that climate change and agriculture could be two other means of, of that to, to occur. So I'd like to turn to Matt McDonald now and ask you about how the global pandemic has interrupted momentum towards tackling climate change. Can we address these multiple eco-security threats? And if so, how? Thanks for that, Susan, and thanks very much for the invitation to uh, participate. Yes, there was clearly a moment of growing support for continued growing support for climate action before the COVID crisis hit, certainly in countries like Australia, especially after the um, bushfires. Australians identified climate change as the most significant threat facing the country in the um, in a Lowy poll, though by April of this year, Support for strong action on climate change had actually slipped a little bit in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. We've also, at the international level, of course, seen COP26, the Conference of the Parties, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, has been postponed, although that may be a godsend, uh, depending on the US election. It's now going to be well after the elections actually conducted. And hopefully that time frame will mean more states committing to more ambitious plans for their national commitments to emissions reduction before that meeting rolls around in November 2021. Addressing the challenge simultaneously or thinking about the relationship between them, the nature of the challenge they pose is, is quite complicated because at one level there are these parallels, but there's also some big um, sort of points of difference. So in some ways, the, while we have been focused, of course, recently on the scale of the challenge, policy and political uh, facing responses to COVID-19. Climate change is harder um, because we're clearer with COVID about what a worst case scenario looks like. We generally can see the efficacy of different forms of response to COVID-19. We, it looks like it will be fairly short term and so it's easier to justify sacrifice. And a lot of the sacrifices that individuals and communities think they're making are to protect families, loved ones, neighbours. All those things are different with climate change with uncertainty about time frames and the specific effects in specific places. We're looking at a long term climate changed world in the context of the types of challenges. And, we need action not so much to protect ourselves in wealthy societies, but for to protect future generations, other living beings and, and people in developing states, those most vulnerable to manifestations of climate change. So at that level, it's harder, climate change, but COVID responses at least to, to grasp the positive, COVID responses at least tell us that we seem 
to be capable at different points of deferring to experts and we're able to accept sacrifices if we perceive a genuine crisis. So there's some hope in this, in this context. It's also the case, and this builds, I think, on Simon's points, that um, both these challenges point to the reality of the Anthropocene context and the idea that it's getting harder to separate ourselves from um, the world in which we live as uh, humans. The imperative of thinking in different ways about our relationship to the natural world and the way we think about concepts like security, there are windows of opportunity to revisit both. We would hope in this context that rather than insulating ourselves, you know, a sort of gated community model like uh, the UN Human Rights Rapporteur suggested that in the context of climate change, we might see something like a climate apartheid in which wealthy states focus on ad adaptation locally while leaving impoverished populations to feel the brunt of a challenge they're least responsible for creating. We, we could hope alternatively that this, we might in these contexts recognise that the global and transnational nature of the challenges we face, the impossibility of addressing them wholly unilaterally, and that applies to both COVID and uh, climate change. More substantively, I think there's a window for us to use this opportunity to revisit things like, at a substantive level, energy infrastructure, fossil fuel exports, modes of transportation, um, diet. In, in the past, in countries like Australia, there's been a perceived, when a perceived crisis has come along, this backburning issue of climate change might have been seen as something to put on the back burner. As a, and the economic imperatives of responding to a crisis might be seen as a, an excuse for inaction given economic perceived economic costs of climate action. But if we think about something like energy production in Australia, the market's driving investment in renewables and the fossil fuel industry increasingly requires propping up from government itself. So the economics versus environment argument is getting harder to make and harder to sustain and we might be in a window here to really revisit um, elements of that relationship. More broadly, there may be a window here, hopefully to revisit fundamental assumptions about how we live, the limits of our ethical universe, about who or what needs protecting and from what threats. My book on ecological security, which is forthcoming with Cambridge University Press, will address all of these uh, questions and will be available in time for Christmas. 2021 and um, will really be an ideal gift for that special someone. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. So managing to put in a, a fantastic plug there for your upcoming book while still pointing out the difficulties that we have in, in addressing these, um, these critical, critical issues. What I want to do now is turn to Robert, who's looked at domestic food security. And this is one of the uh, sort of multiple layers, if you like, to, uh, to the COVID-19 crisis to, and to, the, uh, to climate change. So my question for Robert is um, looking at how um, states like Australia uh, have been trying to uh, listen to experts or whether or not climate scholars are being listened to in countries like Australia and to identify um, how the agricultural sector is adapting to the sorts of challenges that climate change and shifting pathogen pressures are likely to have in the coming years. So over to you, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Thanks for uh, inviting me along today. Um, so uh, this bit of work that you're referring to, um, that I'm gonna talk about for the next few minutes, um, is a, a small and somewhat idiosyncratic bit of work that I've been doing with my uh, colleague, Gab Miller at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and it was done sort of through a sociological lens and it was done uh, before the pandemic. Uh, but it was really interesting to see COVID confirm some of the broader downstream dysfunction in the food system that uh, we were sort of thinking about when we were putting this um, together. Because COVID really sort of put the, the global food system through a bit of a stress test. And most experts would say that it basically failed uh, that test. We saw it disrupted global supply chains. It induced panic buying. It, it caused uh, prices to skyrocket. We saw food importing states left in the lurch. Um, and it saw a lot of governments to be uh, more or less unprepared for all of these things. And it also underscored, uh, as you rightly note in your question, something environmental researchers have known for decades, which is that our food systems are super fragile uh, and left unchecked, uh, climate change will knock all those dominoes down. Um, we, we, we know all the stats that the changes in temperature and extreme weather will make it difficult to grow crops, it'll threaten livestock, reduce their fertility. Warming temperatures will increase the prevalence of parasites and diseases that affect crops and, and livestock. Uh, and all of this will, will make the food difficulties we've seen around COVID seem pretty um, 
insignificant, really. Um, and what's interesting is, is that in the absence of effective plans from governments to build resiliency into the system, uh, it often falls on farmers and agriculturalists themselves to take the lead in adapting to climate change through regenerative farming practices, disaster preparedness, adoption of new technologies. Um, and so in this study that you're referring to specifically, we wanted to understand how farmers on the ground in Australia were approaching these issues. Um, and interestingly, despite being the most tangibly impacted by the first order effects of climate change, um, most of Australia's agricultural regions have remained pretty much ambivalent about climate change and the need for transformative on-farm adaptations. So we see the highest rates of, of climate denialism and hostility to climate policy. So we wanted to understand how the experience of a really extreme and prolonged climate event like the current drought um, might begin to shift opinions on these issues within agricultural communities. If you're joining us from outside Australia today, it's worth noting that for more or less the last three years, uh, much of Eastern Australia has been uh, punished by a pretty bad uh, drought. And between 2018 and 2019, it got really, really bad. So we were guided by the hypothesis that in effect, the experience of a really prolonged and intense drought um, might push farmers towards their thresholds for coping, create a rupture in these views on climate change and the need for agricultural adaptation. Uh, so we went out and interviewed livestock farmers across northwestern New South Wales during the very worst days of the drought, which would have been uh, last July and August, um, investigating how that experience was influencing their views, whether it was making them more likely to believe in climate change, more likely to change their farming practices and build that resiliency into the system. Um, and interestingly, or horrifyingly, however you want to uh, look at it, uh, we found that while the drought was taking an enormous financial, emotional, and psychological toll on all the respondents, in some cases completely bankrupting their farms, uh, it wasn't really changing their views on climate change at all uh, or their farming practices. There was really just a few notable exceptions uh, in the graders that we talked to. And so you might ask, as we did, how is that possible? Your, your farm is being destroyed by an extreme climate event, one that you yourself acknowledge is the worst you've ever seen. And yet you still don't believe in this stuff, nor are you planning to adjust your farming practices when the science is telling you this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. And so without getting into the nitty gritty kind of sociological analysis that we went into, the interviews revealed that there's a whole bunch of really fascinating psychological lock-ins, historical memories of resilience, local cultural values that were undermining the perception of their own vulnerability uh, while enlarging the perception of their ability to endure these sorts uh, of events, because indeed, all the respondents said this was the worst drought they'd ever seen and that over the last generation they'd seen hotter than normal temperatures, changing the length of timing and seasons, declining crop yields, uh, and yet most remained quite skeptical about the scientific consensus around climate change. There was a, overall a low level of association between climate change and this drought, uh, with most, most of them just seeing it as an extension of normal processes. There was your, your typical familiar populist themes that uh, farmers were being silenced by elites that were trying to control the flow of information around the drought. Um, uh, we also focused on how they're planning to respond to the types of, of changes that they were seeing and interviews revealed again that rather than encouraging them to adapt, the psychological lock-ins had created a path dependency in the types of responses that they were willing to consider. Uh, very few of them saw the need for any type of radical transformative adaptation either on their farms uh, or across the agricultural sector um, as a whole. So to come back to your question, I, I'm, I'm prattling on, but uh, the real upshot here is, is that at, at least through the lens of, of this particular research, and obviously livestock farmers are not completely indicative of farmers as a whole, you do tend to see more forward thinking in different sectors. Um, it doesn't look that good. The, the bottom end of the agricultural sector in this country does not appear to be adapting to these sorts of challenges in the way that you would hope. Uh, and governments are obviously pretty unprepared. The hope is obviously that COVID will have been a major wake-up call, that these sorts of disruptions to the food supply will become more common, and COVID was really just a very minor dress rehearsal for all of this. Um, but you have this problem that large segments of the industry and population refuse to acknowledge that there's even a problem to be addressed. And so um, this kind of brings us back to the, the rather banal but important conclusion, uh, and, and Matt mentioned this, that climate change will be infinitely harder to, to solve than COVID. COVID needs these vaccine breakthroughs and then we'll probably get back to some sense of normalcy. Um, but for climate, we already have the technologies we need. We already have the processes, the, the, the policy mechanisms needed to deal with this, but we're not doing them. Uh, we're saddled with the much harder task of creating social and ideological change. Uh, and, and this study that we did, I think reminds us that this 
is, is going to be the major source of difficulty um, going forward. Thanks very much, Robert. I just want to uh, mention to all of you listening at home or wherever you are that you're welcome to put a question in the Q&A um, in the webinar and feel free to do so. We have, uh, we have experts on hand to, uh, to answer your questions. I'm gonna take up this final point that, that Robert made and then lead into some general questions for the panelists about the fact that we have the technology and we have the, the processes to tackle climate change. It is an incredibly complex one, but, it's, uh, but we do have the ability uh, to, to respond to that crisis. So my question for all panelists is, um, what sort of institutions do we have that are capable of addressing these multiple problems? Because in, in today's discussion, we've talked about biodiversity, we've talked about climate, and we've talked about this in terms of the current health emergency. So what sort of institutions, if I can maybe go back to you, Simon, um, what sort of institutions do you think we have that can tackle these crises? I think that we need to think about climate in rather different ways than traditional environmental issues have done. Uh, it's been about protection mostly, it's about being stopping pollution, after all we've got to stop emitting these horrible greenhouse gases. Um, but I think we need to think much more about uh, production. We need to th think much more about how it is that we shape economies um, so that they don't require large amounts of fossil fuels. Um, for those of you who are listening that haven't caught the accent, I was born in Ireland. Um, and indeed, the uh, development strategies of, of Ireland when I was a kid and a teenager um, were driven by this outfit called the Industrial Development Authority. Um, and they explicitly targeted certain industries because that was deemed as a key part of what the future economy of Ireland ought to look like. Um, very unpopular over the last 30 or 40 years in a world of neoliberalism where markets are supposed to make all these decisions. But of course, markets don't make many of the key decisions. Many of the key innovations, um, particularly in the United States, are driven by military um, research agendas and by other state-led um, agendas. In terms of climate change, we need to shift to thinking very quickly about how do we make solar panels not carbon dioxide? How do we make windmills not methane? How do we make regenerative agricultural systems? And to Robert's point, this is not going to be easy in the way that rural political ecology often um, plays out these days. But we need to stop and think about this as a development problem, as something about building a new economy um, which does not rely on fossil fuels. And in that sense, there are numerous indications that um, uh, institutions around the world are starting to think about this. Yes, even the American military worries about this because they have to go and deal with disasters on a regular basis. But lots of the big development banks are suddenly waking up and going, oh, we have a climate problem. Um, even if the farmers in some parts of rural Australia haven't woken up and realized it, the vulnerability of supply chains um, uh, to disruptions from floods, fires, and, and, and other things um, is making uh, lots of banks, particularly development banks, start to think seriously about the vulnerabilities. Where are they putting their investments? And indeed, they are starting, uh, the European Development Bank and various other institutions in Europe are phasing out on fossil fuel investments. Um, the politics of this, of course, is, is, is complicated. Um, here in Canada, from where I'm speaking from, um, we have a, a government, particularly in Alberta, that wants to pour billions of dollars into building more pipelines um, to export bitumen, um, precisely the kind of, of fossil fuel that makes everything worse. Um, but in many parts of the world, it's being tackled increasingly as a development issue um, about what big funders are actually going to fund in terms of infrastructure. And thinking about it in those terms is a long way from perhaps what one would traditionally understand security studies to be about. But climate change is a production problem. It's an investment problem. And shifting financial resources in the aftermath of the recovery um, uh, out of fossil fuels and into solar smart grids, um, those wonderful um, uh, electric bikes which are proliferating around the world and making life so much um, easier for those of us with old legs, um, you know, those kinds of innovations are, are things that uh, I think we need to move on quickly. Um, and thinking about it in those kinds of terms, rather than in traditional international security terms, gives us a whole bunch of institutional handles to work with 
on the climate change, but it does require us thinking about it as investment, um, not about traditional environmental protection. If we can make those kinds of shifts and think about what kind of future economies are needed for us to live securely, uh, then we can begin to mobilize all sorts of social resources beyond either traditional environment or traditional um, security institutions. And I think that's part of the challenge is how we frame this issue in the next few years is going to matter in terms of the policy responses greatly. That's fantastic. Thanks, Simon. I, I, I think um, recognising it as a, as a productive production issue and uh, looking at how different investment um, will drive uh, responses to climate change is incredibly important. Lorraine, how would, you, uh, how would you respond to whether or not we've got the institutions capable of responding to climate, climate change and, and multiple overlapping problems? Susan, thank you so much for asking the hard questions. Um, I, I, I want to go back to the question itself because um, we've, the, we've been talking a lot about we have the technology, we have the institutions, and I really want to say, well, who is we? Um, because I think in this context, we, we have to think first about, just look at something like COVID and the pandemic. This is... Um, when people say to me, oh, the world's changing, I go, you know, for millions of people across the world, this is just one more form of precarity on top of a whole lot of others. This is not uh, even necessarily something new. If you think about previous and recent um, pandemic and, and human infectious diseases, for example. Um, so for a significant proportion of the people in the world, if you're in Yemen at the moment, there's 8 million people facing starvation because of collapse of food systems. COVID just complicates that, but it doesn't trump that. So well, perhaps not trump is the right word, um, but perhaps it is. Uh, so that's the first thing. So, so my response to your question first would be that it's not just about the institutions, but it's about how those institutions frame the problem and how they frame the solutions. And, and one of the things is that we, in terms of that whole decarbonisation debate and disrupting carbon lock-in, we need to pay more attention to questions of justice. And I, and I think about justice in distributive terms, in procedural terms, in recognition terms, and in cosmopolitan terms. And so we can have the best technology in the world, but if we're not asking questions about what is the distribution of winners and losers in the way that technology is used and applied at questions of scale, including local, then we're missing something in the way those institutions function. So, so the, the institutions as they function at multiple levels need to think about where are the marginalised voices. So for example, I've just been doing some um, co-authoring work with a colleague. We're looking at, um, at uh, uh, transitions to low carbon economy um, in Indonesia, where there's a, there's a real move, for example, to change the electri electrification ratio to bring renewables up to about 23%. At the same time as you have the major um, electricity and, and um, fossil fuel companies controlling how the grid is function. So, so in the absence of those questions, those institutions simply don't work. So, so that would be the first thing. The second thing I think I'd, I'd say is picking up on points that I think everybody's made about the role for traditional security institutions. In the areas that I work on, not just transnational environmental crime, but another, but a range of other issues, but let's look at, say, transnational environmental crime. Um, there's some really interesting revisiting of the, of the whole discourses on the securitization and the militarization of conservation, uh, both in terms of, of on-the-ground practice, the way in which we respond, respond to uh, um, poaching, for example, um, it goes back to a rather misleading article that was published, I think, in the late 1990s, perhaps the early 2000s, called uh, Poaching for Bin Laden, which made a range of allegations about the relationship between illegal wildlife trade poaching and, uh, and terror groups. Um, empirically, the data is incredibly thin, but it's something that's been picked up. But there's also a real question about, uh, about how you find that balance between the traditional institutions of security that have capacity, but actually when you start to insert them into conservation spaces, into biodiversity spaces, you've, it, it raises a whole range of problems, not least of which, again, it marginalises other more effective kinds of concerns about, about managing livelihoods, 
are about rethinking that whole discourse of conservation um, as a historical, partly as a historical colonial discourse. So I think it's not just what do the institutions look like, but it is actually how do they function discursively and practically. I think it's really important that you've identified justice as something that needs to be looked at, um, recognising that there are a range of different experiences that people are having in relation to climate change, biodiversity loss and the, and the pandemic situated within, uh, within their own lives. Can I push you a little bit further to explain what you mean by securitisation and weaponisation? You mentioned that in your, in your talk a little bit earlier. Again, thank you for the big question. Uh, <laughs> So, so the securitization, particularly if, if I go back to the illegal wildlife trade is one of the areas I've been working on, uh, there's been a, a growing argument that the reason we should be concerned about this, about illegal wildlife trade, about poaching, etc., is not because of uh, the impact on biodiversity or the impact on local communities as a result of those, uh, those human, um, non-human species interactions, but because it is somehow linked to providing uh, terror finance and, and funding for uh, um, terror groups. The focus has been on, um, particularly on Africa, but we also see the securitized in the concepts of broader claims about transnational organized crime. Um, although, and if everybody else is, is, is um, is making uh, comments about their forthcoming books. Sometime between now and the end of the year, fingers crossed, the book on transnational environmental crime and the functioning of criminal networks should be at least dry, fully drafted. Um, uh, but so the securitization is that it's linked to transnational organized crime without anybody actually saying what they mean by that. And actually the evidence that what we think of as being Organized, transnational organized crime groups that are normally involved in, in drugs, the, the supposed cartelization. The evidence of that in illegal wildlife trade is very thin, as opposed to criminal practices that are organized, which is a different thing. It comes also, I think, to some of the comments that people have made about how supply chains function. It's really interesting to see these intersections. The, the sort of securitization and weaponization is, if you look at the way in which in the United States, for example, it's now referred to as the Wuhan virus, the China virus. I, there's no time to go into um, the accuracy of a lot of the claims that are being made about wet markets in Wuhan, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions about it um, even offline. But it's become a really easy way to be part of those bigger debates about who are the bad guys in world politics. So that weaponization, you know, Trump talks about this as the China virus, the Wuhan virus. And, and uh, that, that becomes an easy way of making of political scoring, but also an easy way of um, opening up space for the kind of health nationalism that you've talked about, the kind of xenophobic, we see this in Australia, all of a sudden, if you're from, if it seems that you might be an Asian Australian, somehow you are now responsible for this. So that's what that's kind of what I'm talking about, I guess. So there's a big dimension to it and there's a there's a focused dimension to it. Great, thanks. I'm gonna to move to Matt and uh, and then Robert before we go to a, a question from the audience. Um, Matt, what's your take on whether or not we've got institutions capable of dealing with these contemporaneous problems? Obviously, if you were thinking how do you how do you develop institutional frameworks that are capable of responding to genuinely global problems, you wouldn't start with the state system. It's not a system that's designed or that, that is set up to enable you to achieve those types of those types of ends. And in some ways, you know, one of the things that I that I think there are profound questions about the legitimacy of key institutions of global politics in the sense that the demonstrable failure to address what is the most pressing global security threat, you know, increasingly recognised as such in the context of climate change. You know, given that institutions like states exist to provide for the well-being of individuals within it, this is the social contract, this is what they're for. It does raise fundamental questions about the legitimacy of those institutions and we really shouldn't let them off the hook. I think um, to, to the extent that I'd put a positive spin in terms of institutional capacity, though, it would be at the level I think it is possible and we can see at the domestic level in Australia, but also 
internationally, it's possible for institutions to uh, be a little bit nimble about how they deal, how they define their remit and how they, um, you know, as Lorraine said, how they represent and respond to particular issues, how they frame um, particular issues. And this sort of, you know, the work that Dryzek and Pickering have been doing on reflexivity in institutions, I think is really interesting here and the idea that it's, it is actually possible to imagine even the existing institutional structures that we have being a bit more reflexive and a bit uh, lighter on their feet in terms of responding to um, contemporary problems, even contemporaneous problems. There's also, it's also, and this I think touches at some level on the, um, the question that um, David mentioned in the chat about um, the role of different forms of actors and movements. And, you know, for me, one of the really challenging things about an issue like climate change is that you do require action at everything from the level of intergovernmental organisations to individual behaviour and literally everything in between. One of the positive spins of that is that it's possible to conceptualise and to recognise agency at almost every level. So you can say there are things that we can do about it, there are things that social movements do about addressing this and I think even in the Australian context a lot of the action that we've seen on renewables has been driven by state governments you know a lot of responsibility for land clearing is state governments it's local governments as well can do their part so I think there are sort of ways in which we can say yes the state system and the broader institutional context is not set up at any level to imagine a, an effective response to climate change but it's possible a to imagine them being flexible enough to address those problems and be to recognise the agency that exists at multiple different levels um, institutionally. Thanks, Matt. And Robert, what's your position? Unfortunately, I, I don't think that we necessarily do have the institutional capacity um, at, at the moment, things going as they are. But I, I think, again, trying to put sort of a hopeful spin on it, we at least see some uh, more sorts of spontaneous, informal, bilateral, multilateral associations of, for example, finance ministers and things like that, the way that we did after the uh, global financial crisis. I think picking up in particular on, on Simon's point about this being mostly um, an investment issue, uh, I think the main focus in the near term has to be how we spend all the stimulus money that is, is being teed up. I think one really good thing you can say about COVID uh, is that it provides a once in a lifetime opportunity to invest the sort of money required to deal with a lot of these problems, both decarbonizing the global economy um, and investing in the medical R&D capable of efficiently tackling future uh, pandemics. I think with regard to the environmental crisis, um, governments are expected to inject somewhere between 12 and $20 trillion into the world economy over the next three years, an incredible and unprecedented sum of cash. And, because of the scale of that investment, um, it will literally define the inter infrastructural characteristics of the global economy for 30, 40, 50 years. And it'll dictate whether countries will be on track to be carbon neutral by 2050. So these recovery packages, uh, in my judgment, will be much more important than any regulatory commitments made through conventional institutions like the UNFCCC. Uh, we, we know that even if governments did implement all the commitments they'd made at Paris in 2015, which they're certainly not, uh, but even if they did, we'd still warm by up to four degrees. So I think the key thing for the moment isn't to see global environmental politics as a regulatory exercise uh, per se, as it typically is, but rather to think about those mechanisms to loosely guide the way that all this money gets invested, making sure that the investments are complementary, that they're mutually reinforcing, that uh, emerging clean technologies aren't being unfairly patented, and that IP is being shared so that it doesn't turn into this unruly game of technological mercantilism between big countries. Um, and, and, and obviously, I think most importantly, we need mechanisms to ensure that this money isn't being invested in high carbon pathways. Um, if this recovery in any way mirrors the investments made after the 2008 financial crisis, which included major supports for fossil fuels, we will almost certainly lock ourselves into runaway climate change. Uh, and the low price of fossil fuels at the moment makes it likely that a lot of countries are going to be very tempted to go down that route. Um, so establishing any mechanisms, whether formal, informal, bilateral, multilateral, what, whatever you like, around the appropriate way to spend this money is going to be absolutely paramount, I think. Okay, thanks, Robert.
I think uh, we're, we've identified a whole range of different industries that are responding differently to, to the COVID crisis and to the climate change in terms of investment and production and uh, perhaps not changing enough in, in, in terms of the Australian farming industry. I've got a question in the Q&A from Professor David Schlossberg, who's asking if we can comment on the role of social movements in shifting opinion and policy in terms of the youth climate movements, the Extinction Rebellion, divestment or local community movements on redesigning food and energy systems. I see Matt has already taken a stab at that. Um, would any one of the panelists like to comment on, uh, on social movements changing how we respond to these contemporaneous problems? Simon and then Lorraine. And I, I just a brief comment on that. I mean, I think that the, there's no simple answer to that. It, the movements are having different effects in, in different, um, different parts of the world. Um, clearly, Greta Thunberg has, has stimulated a whole lot of attention um, uh, and done it with you know, an extraordinary gesture in terms of having a school kids going on strike because they're not learning the right stuff. Um, and it's just utterly brilliant. Um, uh, but it has been picked up in different ways in different parts of the world. Um, and of course, it, the very fact that we are now in, in, in pandemic lockdowns, limiting um, the kind of the, the social connections has, has been very damaging to that climate movement in, in many ways. On the other hand, you know, she has inspired a whole lot of online activism and so on. Um, and I think that that provides a, 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 a way in different societies to, to address these issues. Um, in, in, in ways that has, I think, shaken up the, the, the conventional understanding. Um, because if you're her age, um, uh, you might aspire to live through the rest of the century. Um, and it's very, very clear to people of her age that unless we get the uh, money that Robert was talking about a minute ago spent on the right things, um, they are not looking at a, at, a, at a decent old age at all. Um, uh, and they get it. Um, whether they can convince the um, decision makers in the big banks and the investment houses um, that that's where they should put their money and they should divest it from the, the, the fossil fuels. That's playing out differently country by country. It's sort of an empirical question for researchers in different parts of the world to track. Um, but overall, I think she has, um, well, Greta Thunberg has, has inspired a generation to, 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 to become active. And I hope um, uh, that once the, um, some of the restrictions in the, uh, the, the COVID lockdown um, are, are, are lifted, that indeed youth movements will um, continue to, to, to push the agenda on this one. I think you're right, there is an intergenerational difference. Lorraine, do you want to comment? I'd really just like to pick up on particularly David's point about local community movements and local community action. And again, uh, I think this talks to the questions of scale in terms of institutional responses. Um, one of the things that I think that there's more research to be done on um, in a range of uh, uh, eco-security and, and um, biosecurity, bio biodiversity issue areas is uh, local level communities as sites of governance. Some of the work that we've been doing on decarbonisation, for example, green economy transitions, um, shows, shows that actually local communities um, often have quite innovative ways of are dealing with these kinds of problems, but they're not necessarily uh, ways that are recognised as technically sophisticated or as even institutionally sophisticated. Um, but there is a, there's a lot of work um, being done, I think, by local communities, both in the Australian context, but also um, in other parts of the world. And I think we need to, th to think about how that functions and how we understand agency beyond the state, to use that Earth System Governance Network uh, concept. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is to perhaps say something about this when it comes to um, the illegal wildlife trade specifically. And it goes back to, to the comment that I think a number of us have talked of, have made now is about is about the framing of a problem and the kinds of actions and what motivates actors. In the illegal wildlife trade, um, what one finds is that there's an extraordinary number. If we move from the idea of social movements to, if you like, an institutional representation through non-governmental organisations particularly. There's an extraordinarily large number of NGOs now working in the illegal wildlife trade space. Uh, some of them are working actually quite closely with governments and as Susan knows, um, I've done some work on what kind of accountability mechanisms are actually then embedded in that. Some of those um, 
larger NGOs are actually almost looking to um, sort of proto-military kinds of responses, actually arming rangers, dealing with a whole range of things there. I think it raises, raises some really kind of interesting ethical issues uh, in that respect. And the other aspect of this is that they often focus on charismatic megafauna. So you can count any number of um, NGOs making broader claims about their commitment to biodiversity, but they're focusing on elephants, rhinos, big cats, great apes. Pangolin now has become charismatic, which is an interesting transition, but nobody's doing work, or very few of them are doing public work on tokai geckos or slow lorises or seahorses. And, and so it's, again, it's really interesting to see, even when we start to talk about local movements, we talk about social movements and NGOs, is, is how they act as political actors, not just as, as socially active, as social activists. So I, I think need to not lose sight of the fact that um, social movements themselves, and I think it's a Simon's point, uh, have political purposes as well. Thanks, Lorraine. I've got a final question, and as we're nearing time, I might just target it to one or two panellists, which is to really bring in that question of whether or not security apparatuses are the best to address the types of problems that we're seeing now, climate change in the forms of bushfires, um, uh, you know, addressing COVID at the same time. So, um, Matt, can you, um, can you respond as to whether or not you think we can use um, security forces as a means to grapple with, with these types of problems? Thanks, Susan. It's a really good question. And it's certainly there's a lot of discussion within um, some of the people I've been speaking with of late in the defence uh, sector who have very different views about the appropriateness of taking away defence's traditional focus on war fighting and preparation for war fighting by encouraging them to view a role for themselves in terms of disaster relief, for example. Um, I do think, again, you wouldn't start with security institutions as these are the most obvious spaces to think about how we respond to the climate crisis or indeed COVID. But there are unique things about the structure of those organisations that do potentially mean they have an important role to play. So when thinking about something like disaster relief and humanitarian assistance type missions, the scale of things like relocation of populations associated with the bushfire crisis um, the experience sometimes of working overseas in those missions, the um, centralised structure of the actual, and the fact that it's a Commonwealth structure with lots of resources distributed throughout the country, those things together mean that there's a powerful role potentially for something like uh, the defence sector in Australia playing a role in terms of managing those types of problems, at least when it gets to the point of how do we deal with a genuine crisis disaster related scenario in the longer term whether the um, whether responsibility for dealing with something like a natural disaster is located within defense or with another commonwealth organization i'm relatively agnostic about to be honest except that i think what we could agree on is that actually if the bushfires showed us anything it's that um, we can't allow this very ad hoc response in terms of which agents are responsible, where are we getting equipment from, who exactly is answering to whom. And so it's for that reason that the Senate inquiry into the national security implications of climate change was really encouraging defence to say, well, it's not a matter of whether you, um, you want to focus on war fighting or not. This is a key security issue. There are going to be points where we need massive levels of infrastructure to address disaster, for example, and relocation. There has to be a role in that context for thinking about military resources. Thanks, Matt. And just as a counterpoint, Robert, you've spoken a lot about industry and the need for uh, production patterns to change. Do you think security apparatus can help? Well, I, I tend to agree with, with Matt and, and, and particularly with regard to pandemics. I think uh, it, it really is another reminder of how feckless that kind of traditional defense and security spending is at defending us from the real sorts of threats likely to impact human security. I mean, the almost sort of absurd example of this in terms of those, that military spending and those defense contracts is, is the U.S., which spends you know, close to a trillion dollars a year on defense, but couldn't fend off this threat, which has already killed a couple hundred thousand of its people and pushed its economy to the brink of collapse. Um, 
realistically, if we'd listened to the experts over the past 40 years and invested in that R&D, that medical engineering, and the reasonably straightforward institutional capacities required to address this, um, this is a problem that probably could have been addressed for a few billion dollars a year in, in very peaceful spending. Um, so I think in that sense, it, 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 it really reminds us that our traditional military-centric, state-centric conception of security and security spending uh, is pretty ineffective for the sorts of challenges that, that the 21st century has in mind for us. Thank you. We've now come to time, so I'd just like to thank all of the speakers for such a stimulating discussion and to the audience for their engagement. And I'll hope you'll join us at some stage for the next iteration of the CIS Global Forum and look out for that online where we identify uh, another key topical issue. But it's been an absolute delight and I hope that you all stay safe and, uh, and goodbye. Thank you.